and we will also start streaming. Are we ready to go or? Um, I think we are. It looks like we've got a couple of attendees. Okay. Maybe, although it's just barely six o'clock, so maybe we'll give everybody another minute or two. Okay. I'll be giving an introduction, okay. uh, making a few remarks, um, also some announcements. I'll, make a, I'll be making a few remarks about what I've been doing during the pandemic, and then I'll introduce all four of you at one time. And then after that, you can take turns saying whatever you want to say for, I guess, up to about 10 minutes each. But you don't have to use the entire time. Okay. Well, I don't have a speech. <laughs> Me neither. Well, say whatever you want to say. So. And I'll introduce Alan first, followed by Murr, and then Corey, and then Rebecca. I guess I'll introduce them even if they're not here. <laughs> <laughs> do you want me to promote the twitch stream or is that a, a, a an am, exclusive thing it is supposed to well actually i don't think it matters oh yay it is running now okay yeah i saw it was up i didn't know if you wanted me to promote it or not yeah that'd be great okay. i think it's supposed to, I, I suspect technically it's supposed to be exclusive, but I'm not going to worry about it because, eh. Hey, Corey. Hey folks. Hey Corey. Hello. Hi. How's it going? Yeah, good. How about you? Pretty good. Nice to Hi. see you, Mer. Yeah, good to see you. I was kind of hoping this would be an in-person thing, but uh, yeah, tell me about maybe it. next con. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Maybe Hang on, it's... I got to switch audio devices. This battery is dying. Maybe it's better not that we're not in person because we sure. usually make you all dress in some strange theme. <laughs> hmm. How are you doing, Corey? I'm okay. It's, you know, it turns out that like virtual book tours are a lot of work. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I've been, um, well, I'm still more or less doing the day job. And we've had some family crises. My, my daughter broke her wrist. Oh, no. And then no. It, it didn't set very well. And it had to be rebroken last night. <gasps> so that's, been a, that's been an intense time. But wow. everything's good. We're healthy apart from that and solvent. And the book seems to be doing well. And so you can't really ask for better than those three things in 2020. Yeah, no kidding. I'm so sorry. Fiona broke her ankle like fresh day two of freshman year when she was in high school and hey. she just now got through with the PT for dealing with the chronic pain that came from that. So I, no. yeah, no, no yeah. rebreaking, but apparently I understand. Wrists, apparently wrists don't generally require a lot of PT, which I'm very thankful for. Posey had a joint problem last year and I was her PT coach. And oh my. You know, it is a source of enormous parental friction to make your kid do unbelievably boring, painful exercise every day. So I could quite handily live without a recap of that. All right. I think we've reached somewhat of a quorum. I'll be watching the Asgard channel and the Q&A and the Twitch for questions. But uh, Steve, go ahead and take it away. Okay. Thank you. Hi. I'm Steve Rasty. Tim, welcome to the 52nd annual and first virtual Mile High Con. I hope you all are healthy and in a safe place. We're friends here with similar interests. And isn't it great that we're still able to get together even, even if it is virtually? I want to acknowledge that these are strange times to say the least, 
and many of you may be struggling emotionally, financially, or even spiritually. So I hope this weekend will be a pleasant break for you. I know the convention committee has put together a full and quite varied program, and I'm really looking forward to it. First, some announcements. Uh, they are working on the website, uh, I guess, rebooting, doing everything they can to get it going. In the meantime, you can go through this uh, well, the Twitch to look at uh, the website or to look at the various panels. Artist Guest of Honor, Alan Pollock, has a special gallery and discounts exclusively for MHC 52 attendees. Be sure to check it out. The book bar has signed book plates from our guest of honor, as well as many MHC favorites available. Visit them in the vendor's room to purchase a book and receive a book plate while supplies last. Don't forget to join your fellow fans on our Discord server, discuss programs in the programming rooms, or hang out and chat in our online con suite 10 forward. The other day, a friend of mine said dystopia seemed a lot more fun until he found himself in one. For myself, I never wanted a plague, but I always, I always thought that wouldn't it be great if I were somehow forced to stay at home for a while. I get so much writing done and reading and I tackle all those household projects I've been putting off. Well, three months into the pandemic, I hadn't written a word, my longest dry spell in decades. And although I had my to-do list, taped right here to my computer, I really didn't have the heart to tackle any of those tasks. So what did they do during my COVID vacation? Well, I watched season six through nine of Hoarders, pausing the TV now and then to go find something, anything in the house to either give or throw away because that's how that show affects me. I like shows about people who do things really well so I watched The Great Pottery Throwdown, old episodes of Project Runway, and So You Think You Can Dance, Top Chef, Grand Designs, Blown Away, that one's about glass blowing, and Master Chef. I tried to watch Hell's Kitchen, but it was too much like trying to talk to my dad. Before the theaters closed, I went to see two or three movies a week. It's one of the things I've missed the most. Lately, I've been streaming five or six movies a week, sometimes running them for exorbitant prices. I guess it's a kind of addiction. I don't know if we'll have it in theater movies again. We may get out of the habit and that whole economy might change, but I hope not. But I want you to know I didn't spend all of my time watching TV. Like many writers, I tend to accumulate notebooks with nice paper. I fill in several pages, and when the next good-looking notebook comes along, I grab that one instead. This summer, I spent hours extracting usable ideas from more than 50 of those notebooks and combining them into four. I got rid of probably a half dozen file boxes of other papers as well. My main advice to writers is deal with your papers. I downloaded eight hours of Silver Sneakers video classes, and I actually used them. I spent a lot of time doing the balance classes. I'm still feeling a little bit imbalanced, but well, what can I say? I spent some time returning to the writing basics. I revisited three act, four act, five act, or whatever structure, mythic structure, the hero's journey. I read Reading Like a Writer by Francine Prose, which is terrific, by the way. The Sense of Style by Steven Pinker. On Writers and Writing by John Gardner. And I reread Narrative Design by Madison Smart Bell, which is also quite good. I also decided it was a good time to reread The Lord of the Rings. I bought that hardcover combined edition from HarperCollins and a nice desktop wooden reading stand with a little drawer for all my reading supplies. And unlike most of the books I first read in college, The Lord of the Rings is better than I remembered. I also really like reading on that reading stand. That may have changed my reading habits forever. 
I read seven books and numerous articles on ancient Egypt for a project I can't talk about yet. Fun fact, there was more time between the building of the Great Pyramid and the life of Cleopatra than there was between Cleopatra and the invention of the iPhone. That's kind of amazing to think about. I started writing fiction again sometime in June, much of it on the subject of isolation and touches of, the touches of mental instability, which is actually what I usually write about, write about. I haven't had my hair cut since early March, but I do take showers. I haven't been inside a restaurant or a grocery store. I have everything delivered. I now live a cashless lifestyle with the same $5 in my wallet I had in March. I have seen each of my six grandchildren in my front yard at some distance. They showed me their new phones, iPads, boyfriends, and five-year-old Alexandra has lost a tooth. And I have not seen my first great-grandchild, Emilio, born mid-July, but I have seen pictures. So that's how I spent my time. I hope you spent your time better. Now I'd like to introduce our special guest. I'm going to say a little bit about each one of them first, then I'll let them take turns saying whatever they like. Alan Pollock is our artist guest of honor. Born in New Jersey in 1964, Alan was influenced at an early age by Frank Rosetta and Boris Vallejo. In New York City, he studied at the School of Visual Arts, Parsons School of Design, and the New School of Figurative Arts. He spent several years on staff at TSR. Since then, he's done work for Wizards of the Coast and Blizzard Entertainment, and has done covers for HarperCollins, Da Books, Del Rey, Band Books, Tour Books, Rock, and the Science Fiction Book Club. And in 2015, Alan was a nominee for the Hugo for Best Professional Artist. If you go to Alan's Facebook page, you'll see some of his wonderful illustrations, as well as some great video tutorials. I also urge you to check out more of his artwork at alanpollock.com. Author Guest of Honor Mer Lafferty's latest book is Escape Pod, the science fiction anthology celebrating the 15th anniversary of the Hugo nominated science fiction podcast. She's the author of Solo, a Star Wars story, as well as Six Wakes, a clone murder mystery in space that was nominated for the 2018 Hugo, Nebula, and Philip K. Dick Awards. She also wrote Book Burners, a collaboration effort about a group of demon hunters for, for the Vatican, available at Serial Box, as well as the Shambling Guides 1 and 2, winners of the Manly Wade Wellman Award. She has just a wonderful website, merverse.com, with links to her blog and all of her extensive and highly acclaimed podcast work. Author guest of honor, Cory Doctorow, is a science fiction author, activist, journalist, and blogger, the co-editor of Boing Boing, boingboing.net, and the author of Radicalized and Walk Away, Science Fiction for Adults, a YA graphic novel called In Real Life, the nonfiction business book, Information Doesn't Want to Be Free, and young adult novels like Homeland, Pirate Cinema, and Little Brother. His next book is Posey the Monster Slayer, a picture book for young readers. He works for the Electronic Frontier Foundation, is a visiting professor of computer science at Open University, among others, and he co-founded the UK Open Rights Group. He's also the author of Someone Comes to Town, Someone Leaves Town, which is one of the strangest, most imaginal, imaginative novels I've ever read. He's one of our best commentators on how technology changes society. Author guest of honor, Rebecca Roanhorse's latest novel is Black Sun, which just happened to arrive in mail, my mailbox just a few days ago. And I have to be honest that if I weren't so committed to this convention, I'd be sitting here finishing that book. It's a wonderful fantasy epic, which really absorbs you.
and also as a comics fan, I'm really looking forward to her part in Marvel's Voices, Indigenous Voices Number One. Rebecca Roanhorse is a winner of the Nebula, Hugo, and Locus Awards and the 2018 Astounding Campbell Award for Best New Writer. Her novel, Trail of Lightning, book one in the Six World series, won the Locus Award for Best First Novel and is a Nebula, Hugo, and World Fantasy finalist. Her short fiction can be found in Apex Magazine, New Suns, The Mythic Dream, and various anth other anthologies. So I see Rebecca, Rebecca's not here yet. So Corey, would you like to speak next? I'd be delighted to. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. I should point out that I actually left Boing Boing in January, but it tells you how long oh. ago we set this up. Okay. Uh, I'm still co-owner, it's fine, but I, I, these days yeah. you can catch me a pluralistic. This um, moment in our world, in our field, has me thinking a lot about fandom and, and condom and science fiction and what it means. Obviously there's a, a changing of the guard and it is hotly contested and there's lots of stuff going on, both heat and light, all around the edges. And it, it makes me reflect on the parts of this culture that have served me and I think all of us well. And, and the fact that it's all on display here at this virtual con. Um, I grew up in Toronto in the 70s and 80s at a time when there was as close as you could imagine to there being a formal apprenticeship for science fiction writers, thanks to Judy Merrill who started a public library with her and Frederick Pohl's book collection, a library she called the Spaced Out Library, that I went to as a, on a school visit when I was nine years old. And she said, you know, bring us your manuscripts. I'm the writer in residence. I'll critique them for you. And Judy connected me with other writers over the years. And that's how I ended up writing uh, in a workshop with Carl Schrader and Peter Watts and Madeline Ashby and many other writers. And the other people who mentored me were people like Tanya Huff at Baca Books, the science fiction bookstore that's still there, the oldest bookstore in the world. And as you were speaking, I recalled that I went to my very first signing there and I have a picture of me at that signing here. And you can't see him because he's hidden behind the balloons. That's Charles DeLint, but next to Charles is Steve Sterling with whom I was just on a panel at this event. And I see below me in this chat, Mer Lafferty, who is not only a colleague of mine and a friend, but who is also my student uh, and also appearing on this panel, uh, on this, uh, at this con on this bill is Ian Tregillis, another student of mine, along with other teachers of mine. And it strikes me that there's this continuity and this camaraderie between us. And as you were speaking, I thought of this book by, by James Patrick Kelly, his latest short story collection, The Promise of Space, which I discovered to my enduring delight when I opened it to the dedication page is dedicated to both me and Murr. And so here we are in this field where we take care of each other. And also in this field where we so often imagine the end of the world as a time in which our neighbors are revealed to have been bestial monsters all along. Uh, where, where the pulp traditions of man versus nature and man versus man, man get a twofer in man versus nature versus man where the tsunami blows your house down and your neighbors come over to eat you and in which we are nevertheless surrounded by people who are more or less like us, decent, hoping to care for one another, flawed vessels who have good days and bad. And I wonder that we have done so little confronting of the possibility that if you and everyone you know are basically decent, that it's wildly unlikely that 99.999% of everyone else is a total bastard that it would be an incredible coincidence for you to have fallen in such lucky company. And so as we sit here perched at the end of the world, there's this very salient question that science fiction resolves for us. Is the world like fandom or is it like the stories? Are we mostly decent and take care of each other, albeit imperfectly and with bad moments? Or are we all just waiting for the moment of war against all, uh, of all against all and, and ready to turn on one another at the drop of a hat. I, I know which side I'm on. It's the thing that's kept me going through this apocalypse. And um, it's of enormous uh, comfort to be in your company this weekend. Thank you. Sure. Uh, a lot of what Corey said really 
is resonates with me, but that that's not surprising because Corey's been an influence, as he said, since well before 2006 when I got to meet him in person. And I, I always wonder how you guys at cons come up with your guests of honor, because I don't know if you think about this, but putting a writer as a guest of honor alongside someone who mentored her is a huge, it blows your mind, really. Like knowing that I could be a guest of honor next to Corey is just amazing. And I'm so glad he went first because he's so much better at speaking extemporaneously than I am. So I got to see how he does it. So I'm gonna try to follow. Um, first, Corey, you said about whether we're gonna be like fandom or the stories. We already know that because fandom is full of t-shirts and yoga pants and stories are full of leather. And I know what I've been wearing this entire pandemic, and that's been the yoga pants. So I think The Walking Dead needs some rewrites, seriously. Um, you know, my history was, uh, my history started strangely because about 16 years ago in December, I started podcasting because it sounded like a cool thing to do. And not a lot of people were doing it. So you got to be like, is this going to die or is this going to be something big? And I think I just want to play in that sandbox. And then I was trying to build a writing career. Nothing much was happening. So I uh, started throwing my stuff out on podcast, which now that I think about it is self-publishing, but it didn't feel like it at the time. It just felt like a whole bunch of experimentation. And I didn't realize I was building my career in a way that not a lot of people had. And so been tied to podcasting the whole time and still grateful to my uh, people who find me via podcasting, but it's thrilling now to find people finding me through writing. And um, I think it's been an amazing 20 years besides everything that's burned down in 2020, literally and figuratively, but it's been like so many things have changed via technology rights and what you can do. And it's been so amazing to see people experiment like I did with podcasting and Corey has done with Creative Commons and Benjamin Rosenbaum did with Creative Commons. And um, I find it really exciting. I, I had some personal issues in January and February and then March hit and everybody knows what happened after March. And so 2020 is, I know it's so obvious, but 2020 has been a bad year. <laughs> and um, it took me a long, I had a book to rewrite and luckily because of everything, my editor was very understanding, but it took a long time for me to get back to writing. And I, I couldn't find my feet and it, in, it's not even that I was doing like a, I'm very sad under a cloud depression thing. It was just a, I, I, I don't have the spoons, I can't. And so I started um, just for the hell of it. I started doing things on Twitch. I started live streaming my podcast and I am used to being able to say whatever I want, pause whenever I want, say um as many times as I want and then edit all that out. And not so much with the live streaming. And it's been a new um, challenge to me. And I don't know if it was just the proper time passed for me to get my creative feet under me again, or if starting this new media, media, medium, sorry, uh, helped me. But, but I am like becoming a new convert of if you're stuck, whether because of outside problems or inside problems, focus on a completely new direction. And most creative people will probably have some excitement or feel the, 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 the oomph that we have lost this year. I did a lot of uh, watching all the people in Hollywood, especially do their, like Jack Black did a dance in shorts and cowboy boots and nothing else in front of a swimming pool. And for one thing, that guy has the agility of Sammo Hung. I mean, it's amazing. But I'm sitting there watching that going, how are people creating right now? This was like April, I think. I'm thinking, how are people doing that? I don't know. And somebody pointed out that they can't do their jobs right now. 
technically for me, nothing had changed. I was still in my home, able to do my job and work. It's just everything outside was so overwhelming. And that helped a little bit, but I think really what I found this year is a new focus. And frankly, having done podcasting for 16 years, I've become complacent about the size of my audience. And starting over with Twitch has been lovely and humbling because there's not a lot of crossover. So um, I just have found, I've been looking for new ways of stimulating my creativity this year. And I think I finally found it. I am so sad to not be in Colorado right now when I got invited, not only because you know, Corey's a longtime friend and mentor to me, but also I have met Rebecca a couple of times and loved being in her company. And I'm just like, such an honor. It would be so awesome to be there with the, the local fans and Corey and Rebecca. And it didn't happen, but I'm here because of the virtual stuff. And thank you to all you guys have done. That is, it's got to be crushing. I can't even imagine you plan this con and then suddenly it's like, oh, you got to go virtual. Sorry. And, uh, you know, the work you have to do to handle this is impressive. And so I want to thank you for continuing to put on the con and have us here. And I think that's probably enough. Alan? <laughs> Did you say, I, I didn't hear what you said. <laughs> Alan, it's your turn. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, well, um, I, I'm honored to be here as well. I haven't been to a con in quite some time. Um, uh, I don't even know when the last one was. I think it was a Lux con and it was quite a while ago. Um, I switched over from doing um, uh, mostly oil painting to digital. And when doing that, I had um, felt that it wasn't for me to go to a show and hang my digital prints and say, this is my original art, just didn't feel right to me. So I, 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 I'm sure there's people that do it, but for me, I like, I like seeing original traditional art at, a, at an art show. So I decided until I get some more of my own paintings, original traditional oil paintings together, I wasn't really gonna do any more shows. So it's been a while. And, um, and in the process trying to, uh, sort of reinvent myself because I kind of started feeling a little stale in the genres that I was working in. Um, so uh, not to mention um, uh, the way that I used to get work compared to how it is now has changed quite a bit over the years from book publishing and, and things going digital and everything else. So um, uh, yeah, as you were saying, working at home with the pandemic, uh, this is kind of what we do. We work at home. So it's really not very different, um, but it's everything else going around. I'm, I, I'm also doing, um, I, I'm a musician, so I'm going to do a duo with my wife. And so that, that's been greatly affected. Um, we live in an area in New York State where we're surrounded by wineries. We play a lot of the wineries and breweries. And to go from this beautiful environment, the Finger Lakes, and then to have everything be canceled midstream. Um, we got to think of maybe three or four shows out um, before more and more rules and regulations were being put on the wineries to not advertise for the music and to not have steady shows and all that kind of thing. So that all got shut down. Um, and so uh, it was good while it lasted, but I don't know when it's going <laughs> to restart. I hope it restarts in the spring, but who's to, who's to say? And it's, you know, it gets so cold here that, you know, or they can't really do any outdoor shows. So things like that have changed quite a bit. And um, I really was looking forward to coming to Colorado and I've never been there and, and being part of it all. But, um, but this is uh, the way it has to be. So um, I do appreciate all the effort that was put into it and um uh, i'm sure they didn't get the the full amount of people they wanted but um the people that are here hopefully are enjoying themselves and and they're able to see us and and hopefully they have a good time um so yeah i mean uh, i i don't know what else to say about it other than um 
it's a really <laughs> it's a really crazy time and i really hope it doesn't last too much longer but i have a feeling it's going to be a while so we're going to have to somehow figure it out and um you know i think we're in the enter entertainment industry and i think i think when it you know when things like this happen people want to be entertained and they want to be taken away from their everyday life and i think what we do is pretty much key for that you know i think that's that's what we do we create entertainment for people and and um hopefully enjoyment so they can get out of their everyday life and think of other things for temporary so yeah now, i found i was uh, surprised that i was stuck for a few months not writing because i i've worked alone for a number of years now i don't see that many people anyway so it shouldn't have affected me that much but i write for the most part, dark fantasy and horror set in contemporary time. And I found myself thinking, well, I, do I put masks on them or not? Uh, what is the new normal for this? And obviously, if, it, if, it's a, if it's something that only lasts a year or two, I can pretend it didn't happen. <laughs> but if it's an ongoing thing, which I think it may be, I mean, I'd be I'd be surprised if people give up masks right away. I think the pe people be some people be wearing masks for years from now on, maybe forever. Wow. And so, uh, I feel like I have to incorporate that somehow. At the same time, as a horror writer, I'm also uh, aware of cliches and don't want to write about the obvious thing. So I don't particularly want to write about the pandemic. So I'm writing again now, but mostly I just had to make a shift. Uh, Corey, I was really encouraged by what you said about people and the fact that there are, well, good empathetic people out there. I'm usually an optimist, but I found in recent years that's been tested quite a bit. Hmm. And I know that I know people are out there. I know they have empathy, but sometimes it just seems like they're not using it. Well, I guess our circumstances can upregulate or downregulate our empathy, you know, and, and a lot of um, that comes from what we think other people will think of us if we don't show empathy or if we do. Those are yeah. that, that, you know, we we help each other either either display or or um, uh, ignore our empathic responses. But uh, you know, I, I have I have witnessed so much kindness within mm -hmm. this community over the years and cruelty, and I think that it's fair to say that we are flawed vessels, and that and mm -hmm. that we are neither doomed to commit cruelty nor are we automatically going to do something wonderful for one another, and that rather there's a, a an element of human choice. And you know, you talked about being an optimist, and I have come to the conclusion in recent years that optimism and pessimism are both a form of fatalism grounded in the idea that things will either get better or worse irrespective of what we do and rather than that I'm I'm someone who believes in hope which is the idea that if you materially alter your circumstances for the better even though you can't see a way to make them to get to the place you want to be to that as you make that tiny incremental material change you will find yourself at a new vantage point with new terrain revealed that you can ascend towards a, a better place that, you know, treading water after the ship sinks at sea is not going to get you a rescue boat. But if you don't tread water, then it doesn't matter if rescue comes. And, and so I'm a hopefulist rather than an optimist. Um, and, and hope remains so long as you can think of one thing that you can do that will make your circumstances better. That's an interesting distinction. We're just in it. It's just it's just a tough. I mean, there's there's hardships all over all around the world. But for when we're so used to here in America, we're so used to having doing things the way we've done things and having things our way, no matter what, what way it may be, you get used to your your routines and, and and, you know, just things you take for granted. And when it's all of a sudden stripped from you, um, 
there are going to be people, I think in general, the good will out, the good outweighs the bad and, you know, within the population, but you just don't know how people are going to respond to crisis and to things that are stripped away from you. Um, you maybe, maybe the, the, the first, you know, reaction is not positive, but maybe they come around after the fact, but, um, it just remains to be seen. I think in general, it'll, it'll be okay. I don't think we're going to plummet, but I, I do think that, um, you know, some people handle it better than others. And, um, you know, I mean, you just you somehow have to find a way to roll with it and, 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 and figure out how to get through it. But uh, I, I think, you know, everybody here wants to get through it and, and have it turn out positive. I don't think anybody's hoping for the worst. So, um, you know, I think it's just going to take longer than people want it to take. If everybody would just get on board and do what they're supposed to do, maybe we can get through it quicker. And then uh, we'll look back at it and go, man, that was such a stupid year that 2020, man, what were we doing? So. Well, welcome, Rebecca. We've all been saying nice things about you. Oh, hi. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. I actually have a day job right now. Uh, I'm in a writer's room, so we were running yeah. a little late. So my apologies, but I showed up. <laughs> sure. well, we've just been talking about the past year and uh, you can say whatever you want to say. The time's yours. Oh, I, you know, I have nothing to say. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm a little brain fried. I've been uh, sort of in a whole different world all day uh, working on uh, the science fiction project. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm just kind of excited to, to be here and, and talk to folks and fans and, and find maybe a bright spot in what can otherwise seem a pretty uh, dismal timeline right now. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, of course, you know, about what's gonna happen with the US election and, and what comes next. So I think it's great to try to find community, to try to find you know, people uh, who still can share dreams and stories and stories lead us forward and, and show us a different way of thinking, a more positive way of thinking. So let's all sort of get together and, and enjoy that moment. How's that? That's great. Good. And I was showing everybody your book. Oh. It came, came a few days ago, and I wish I could be reading it now, actually, instead of but I'm committed this, <laughs> to this convention. So, but it looks wonderful. Thank Rebecca, you. that was awesome because you and Corey talked about larger communities and stuff, and I talked about yoga pants. So, well done. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. Well, we all uh, encourage people to wear their yoga pants to any community gatherings. So, I think it all comes together. <laughs> I think I'll pass. <laughs> no pants. Uh. I my my <laughs> wife has prohibited me from wearing my boiler suit anymore. I've I've given up on bifurcated <laughs> garments altogether. I'm I'm one step away from tearing a, a neck hole and two armholes in a garbage bag and just just giving in altogether. But but uh, no, I I'm actually uh, t today for you. I wear a bifurcated garment. <laughs> Much appreciated. We're Thank grateful, you. Corey. Thank you. I know. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do when we have to wear real clothes again. I don't think I've worn real clothes maybe in three months. Well, I expect that there's going to be a, a, a great market for elasticated waistbands <laughs> after a year or two of sedentary living uh, and also a, a great upswell in tailoring services. <laughs> I did want to I, say something about uh, what you were saying, Steve, with things that people learn and they're getting out of this. And I'm, and, and what you put in your fiction, because I'm realizing all, I mean, all the stuff we take for granted. I was trying to help my audience through the artist's way. One part of the artist's way is an artist date where you get out and go to places with people and experience things and you know feed your art your inner artist and it's wonderful and i'm like well yeah y'all can't do that um mm -hmm. you're gonna have to find another way around that and a lot of a lot of my audience says like okay well i'll go look at this uh, museum online it, you know that's not the same but you know finding all the things we take for granted and then trying to find a way around that uh 
a friend of mine used to call everything that bad that happened to us grist for the mill. Like just just make it through it and then you can use it in your writing. So uh, I'm trying to find everything from I can't go to an art gallery or a movie to the yoga pants as grist for the mill. Well, I find that I enjoy the virtual existence. I am kind of geared to enjoy things. So I enjoy the movies I'm watching. I enjoy these these uh, Zoom conventions because I don't have to spend the money on a hotel. I, I attended a climate restoration uh, uh, meeting this summer that I couldn't have afforded to go to. Uh, so all that's great, but I'm also a little worried about getting too used to these virtual goodies because sometimes if I'm not forced to, I tend to stay at home and I really don't think it's good for me. Yeah. I mean, like I said before, we're, you know, nothing really has changed for me. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm home working all the time. My wife is the same way. Um, but I do, uh, and I, and I go out and food shop, you know, so I do go, I do get out to do things. I'm out, I, I'm fortunate enough to be out a little bit more out, not way out in the country, but I'm, I'm about a half hour from Ithaca, New York. So I'm kind of up, I'm in a country area, but I can get to civilization quite quickly, but I'm, I'm out away from people. I'm not in a very tight city area where there's lots of pop, lots of people. So I can get out. And then, like I said, the places around here have had music and have had um, the wineries have had things where you can actually go and still do wine tastings and things like that, but it's limited. So they don't have as much as many people, but I can still get out and see some people and do some things. But the, for me, the, the, you know, the theater, Broadway, New York City and movie theaters and concerts and carnivals and fairs and all these big event place thing, you know, things where lots of people get together. I just can't imagine that that's, it's never going to be there again. That, that's just too crazy for me to even comprehend. So I have to believe it'll come back and it'll be there again. It's just going to take some time. And so I do miss that kind of thing. And, and I have gone out to restaurants. I, um, again, the, the places around here have had outdoor seating. They've had, um, uh, you know, it, we don't have as, 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 as high in numbers where, where, where I'm living right now, like in Ithaca, Ithaca's rising a little bit because of Cornell and the students, but it hasn't been so crazy as it is in other places. So I've been fortunate in that regard, but um, I, I feel really bad for the people that live and breathe conventions that are, you know, fans that go to like dozens of them a year, or they just can't wait for the next one and the next one and the next one. And it's all shut down. And I don't, you know, I don't know when the next one, when it's going to be coming back, you know, I don't know about a year from now, maybe two years, but um, uh, so this is at least something where they can at least hear us and see us and uh, ask questions. And, and, you know, I mean, like, like Steve said, I mean, it, there's probably a lot of conventions where I cannot afford to go to that maybe now with the virtual possibility, I can at least be part of it and see it. And, and, and maybe I might not ever get to them uh, physically because of the, the, the finances, but um, at least I can go to a lot more in the virtual way, so. I think that's absolutely right. Like I think, um, you know, recently FIACON, they, they had a, a FIA magazine, which is a, a black speculative fiction magazine through their first con. And it was very international. I mean, uh, because, because we are online, they were able to reach out to writers, you know, in the Pacific, writers uh, in New Zealand, writers, you know, across Asia. And and invite them into the con, you know, so they could be on panels and they could be talking, maybe it's 3 a.m., you know, in uh, Denver, but it's, you know, it's like 3 p.m. in the Pacific. So the con ran like 24 hours and it was amazing. And all of these writers and all of these people that would normally not be able to participate in a con, much less uh, attend a con, got to do that. And I think that we have to sort of look at some of the positives uh, that this sort of online world has brought us. Uh, and it's and we're able to highlight 
artists and creatives and people that normally we wouldn't get to see. I mean, I might not even know uh, that, you know, some of those speculative fiction writers are out there and creating and certainly not what they're creating without opportunities like this. So I think that's kind of exciting. And like I mentioned, I'm in a writer's room, but I don't live in LA. I mean, that would have never happened uh, previously. You had to go live in LA to write a TV, uh, write on a TV show. Uh, but I'm up every day with people who are sort of scattered around the United States, like, well, about 75% of them are in LA and we're creating, you know, this show together uh, in a way that would have never happened uh, if we hadn't, you know, been sort of turning, having to turn to online um, uh, existence <laughs> to, to sort of communicate. And of course, you know, I'm going to go on about this, but just a little bit. There's also folks with disabilities, you know, who can't get out of the house, who could never attend, that can now attend. Uh, so I think there's a whole lot of positives uh, to, to where we are now. And hopefully we could take these lessons and bring them into the future. So next time we all can get together in person, there is a component of online um, sort of conning that allows these other people, you know, from different time zones and with different abilities and all that sort of stuff to be able to attend it as well. I hope there are lessons that we learn here that we don't forget uh, because like meet space is great, but there are all the alternatives. So, so why don't we look to those and see what lessons, you know, we've learned from this and how we can actually expand our horizons rather than just going back to where we were. I don't think we need to go back. We need to go forward. We're forward thinkers, right? <laughs> I like, Definitely. I like to think that this is breaking the inertia of some things that needed to have their inertia broken. You know, I, I mean, I don't want to get too dark, but if you'd asked me a year ago, I would have said that by the time we were alive to the contradictions in our economy and society that are rendering our planet uninhabitable by our species, that we would have doomed maybe three or five billion people to die. And today, cold comfort, it feels like those fracture lines have been revealed in a way that will merely kill millions and millions of people. This is not anything I'm happy about, but the part of me that was, you know, three quarters convinced that my daughter's career options were going to be like a pole sharpener for people digging through the rubble or a urine recycler. Uh, I'm somewhat buoyed by the possibility that we may in fact, like the, like the drunk who has a car wreck and loses a leg and an eye, but finally confronts their addiction and doesn't die, maybe we will confront our contradictions and reform them before we get to the point of no return. Wow. Sorry, that was a little dark. <laughs> a little no, bit, a little but, bit. But, but very true, very true. I thought I was the horror writer. You, yeah, you said it so well, there wasn't really anything to add to it. Yeah. Okay, can, can I bounce off of something Rebecca said that don't involve losing eyes or feet or, or anything? <laughs> yeah. um, I, I have a, my uh, part of my audience is absolutely beginner writers and a lot of them I, I tell them about the value of networking and what networking has done for my career a lot and a lot of them are like I'm like I'm I'm out in the boonies or I don't have a lot of disposable income and it, again it sounds silly right now to say it but you know back in April it was an epiphany which is cons, cons are still going on and now you don't have to worry about the money it takes to get there. So anybody within the sound of my voice can attend any con. You just, I mean, you pay, you pay to get in, you pay the people who are, you know, paying for all the Zoom and all the crap, but, you know, you get to attend. And that is, you know, I have like people in New Zealand who are just like, well, I can go to Worldcon, but what else? And I'm like, well, now you can go to all the other things. You may not get a lot of sleep, but the options are huge now. And while you know networking is a little tougher, we've got the chat, we've got Discord, we've got Twitch, we've got all these things where people can reach out to us and ask us questions or connect or whatever. And while I would love to be in Meet Space now, I can't be. So this is, but but it opens up doors to a lot of other people. And I think that's awesome that, that anybody in Germany right now could be here. Yeah. Tired, but they're here. <laughs> <laughs>
I hope. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I think we're about out of time and I think it's a wonderful note to end on. So thank you everyone, you've been wonderful and I hope you enjoy the convention. Thank you all thank of our guests. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, yeah. appreciate it. Apologies for pleasure. showing up late, but I'm glad I made it. Thank you everyone, have a great night. Thank you. Bye. Take care.